Behind me is the Convair B-58 Hustler, which was the first nuclear-capable jet that flew with the Strategic Air Command that was able to reach Mach 2. And in this video, I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of it. I make videos about planes. I've made tour videos through the B-17, B-29, 36 and 47, and today we're up to the B-58 Hustler, which is coming right up. With the introduction of the MiG-15, which you can see here at the Pima Air and Space Museum, the primary nuclear bomber, the B-36, became obsolete, as it was just too slow. The B-47 was faster, but still subsonic. So, the US needed a new aircraft that could fly both too high and too fast for Soviet interceptors, and in 1956, the B-58 Hustler first took to the skies. The B-58 was the world's first supersonic bomber, and the first to reach Mach 2 as well. In fact, during its career, it set 19 different speed, altitude and payload world records. It also introduced a whole range of new features, which we'll explore now. Starting right at the front is the especially long nose boom, which has a pitot tube at the very end, and also operates as a high-frequency antenna. What's particularly unique and striking about the design is that it's relatively small for a bomber. And while the thin fuselage assisted with reaching Mach 2, it didn't allow any room for an internal bomb bay. So they had this unique and combined removable bomb and fuel pod underneath the fuselage. But even with this, the limited fuel load remained one of its biggest problems. In fact, General Curtis LeMay joked that the B-58 is fine as long as you're wanting to bomb Canada. Here's an inactive B-53 thermonuclear bomb on display in Dayton, Ohio, underneath their B-58. Later on, they did add additional external hardpoints for four smaller B-43 and B-61 nukes, in addition to the central one. This could also carry cameras for reconnaissance purposes. It didn't take long to walk to the rear of the aircraft, and looking forward highlights just how thin the fuselage is. Here's one of those hardpoints I mentioned earlier, and interestingly, this was only ever designed to carry nukes and never traditional bombs. Let's check out the landing gear, which had to be especially long due to the pylon-mounted engines and large pods underneath. The main strut is also very thick, or beefy to use the technical term, and this is because the B-58 had a very fast takeoff and landing speed, and also a very high angle of attack, therefore the whole landing gear would be exposed to a lot more pressure than other aircraft from that era. And to avoid the rubber wheels melting from the aerodynamic heating at Mach 2, the landing gear wheel well was pressurized and air-conditioned. If we quickly jump back to the front, you'll notice that the forward landing gear has a double kink in it, so that it doesn't fold up and hit the pod directly behind it. Now here's one of the four General Electric J79 afterburning turbojets, producing up to 15,000 pounds of thrust. This one has an engine cover, but in Dayton you can see the conical spike that could move to maximise air intake at low speeds and at higher speed it would move further forward to keep the aerodynamic shock wave away from the inlet as that would disrupt the air flowing into the engine. These four engines propelled it to a top speed of 1,319 miles per hour, and it had a surface ceiling of 63,400 feet. The engines were so powerful that it could climb over 40,000 feet in just a single minute. This engine was also used in the F-104 Starfighter, the A-5 Vigilante, and even the SSM N-9 Regulus II cruise missile, which carried a nuclear warhead. Now moving to the rear is the defensive equipment, which includes chaff dispensers and a single 20mm rotary cannon. It was remotely controlled by the DSO, who only had to lock onto the target blip, and then the radar fire control system would do the rest. Because this was meant to fly faster than any known fighter jets at the time, they only ever expected to be firing backwards, hence why there's only just the single gun at the rear. Due to the high landing speeds, there was also a drogue parachute that would be released from under here. As you can see, there's no horizontal stabilizers, which was not uncommon with these delta wing designs. So the pitch was controlled by these elevons, which operates as both elevators and ailerons, which would lift on both sides together, pitching the nose of the aircraft upwards. Now the wing is what's known as a delta wing with a 60 degree wing sweep. While they were well suited to high altitude supersonic flight, they were less effective at low altitude and low speeds. Therefore, it had to take off and land at higher speeds and with a high angle of attack, which means that the nose had to be a long way up in the air before the wing generated enough lift to get the whole plane off the ground. Another problem that made the B-58 so difficult to fly was something known as fuel stacking, where the fuel would be moving around during acceleration and deceleration and change the aircraft's centre of gravity. 
This would result in abrupt pitching and banking. In fact, it was notoriously difficult to fly with 26 of the 116 built being destroyed in accidents. It was one of the first to use aluminium honeycomb panels, which consisted of fiberglass honeycomb sandwiched between two aluminium panels. These were both strong and light. There was a three-person crew with a pilot, a bombardier navigator, and a defensive systems operator of the DSO. They were all sitting in tandem and separated by equipment so they would send each other messages via a string system that ran along the wall. Normal ejection seats would be unsafe at supersonic speed, so they developed novel clamshell seats that would physically protect the crew from the supersonic wind. Here's one back in Dayton, Ohio. It had a control stick and oxygen allowing the pilot to continue flying even when it turtled up and ready for an immediate evacuation. It was also buoyant and the clamshell could be opened and become a life raft. On the nose here was the refueling receptacle. A major problem with the B-58 was the small fuel load, thus requiring constant refueling and it was one of the reasons why the B-52 was just a better aircraft for this role. Another novel design feature was the use of a female voice, referred to as Sexy Sally, that research demonstrated could gain the pilot's attention to an important problem, but also keep them calm. As so happens, female voices were better suited to that role. By the way, the name Hustler comes from a statement made by a senior Convair engineer, who was talking about its speed and said that it sounds like it'll really be a Hustler. The nickname stuck and was eventually made official by the Air Force. It was an impressive design, but also expensive to maintain, had a poor range, and there were now better alternatives. The complex flight control system and Delta Wing also made it quite difficult to fly, hence the higher crash rate. Even for test pilots, who are usually the type who didn't mind taking a few risks, they were requesting transfers out of the program. It also became evident that Soviet surface-to-air missiles could hit targets at high altitude, so the B-58 changed to a low-level penetration role, which reduced its speed and effectiveness. It was retired in January 1970 after only flying for 10 years and was replaced by the B-52, which had a much longer range and was much cheaper to maintain. But the B-58 will always be respected for the groundbreaking design that it was. Please check out my channel for many more similar videos, including me crawling through that B-52 Super Fortress or the B-36 and B-47 that I mentioned earlier. Thanks for watching.